Well, hello, hello, hello. I think we're going here and we're going to give it just a couple more minutes uh, before we get started to let a few other people join. But uh, wanted to thank you all for for joining us for today's conversation. And that's what it's going to be. We'll get going here in just a couple of minutes. In the meantime, we get to see our smiling faces with these really cool backgrounds because you are obviously in the exact same office with this cool logo thing. We're facing each other, aren't we? In a mirrored office? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. The modern way we do meetings. Yep. While we get started, feel free uh, to drop into the chat uh, any information, either questions you came into here with, or maybe a little bit of info about yourself and your current state with uh, co-pilots, with AI, what you know, what you want to know, any of those sort of things, that would be great. Maybe even tell us where you're coming in from. Uh, we're going to try to make this very, very interactive, so feel free to drop some stuff into the chat on that. I, I used to do a version of this mostly for executives that we called whiskey and wisdom. And as you might imagine, it involved doing whiskey tasting. Those were always a little more fun. People were much more eager to jump on the chat after a couple of uh, yeah, I bet. sips of whiskey. I'd argue the wisdom <laughs> might go down as the whiskey goes up. Uh, you know, I you know, I would say that the wisdom went up because people talked wow. and we you true, know, sort of went and now, why I'm bringing it up here with the chat, it's like this is much more interesting if you engage and participate yeah. and put some stuff out there. So, all right, well, let's go ahead and get this going. Um, we have uh, plenty of people on, and so we would like to dive into the conversation. And as you probably have already got an inkling about, this is almost going to be the un-webinar, right? This is, I guess it's talking heads and that you have Tim and my heads here and we're talking, but you're not going to have a lot of slides. We have slides, but they're boring. They're very boring because what they have on them are questions. Um, this is just going to be really an interactive session where we try to address the 10 questions, the 10 things that you need to know uh, before you invest in a co-pilot for IT because I, and I'll give you my background here in two seconds, but uh, I've sat through a lot of different presentations. I've given presentations, been a part of these conversations. And the one fact that I think is unquestionable when it comes to the intersection of AI and enterprise IT is how much ambiguity there is, how many questions there are, because the sort of the understanding is all over the place. And I'm not going to say Tim and I will have all the answers. In fact, I would love for someone to stump us and to say, you know what, we don't we don't actually know that. Let's go find that out. But I think that there is so much to uncover when we're talking about AI in the enterprise that these sort of sessions are hopefully going to be very useful and informative. So um, with that, we're going to we're going to dive in um, before we do the intros and just get into the conversation. Please use either the chat or the QA. We're going to be watching both uh, to ha ha throw your questions into the room. We are happy to throw our questions out if you give us something that is meaty that that will help everybody kind of understand this better. So please dive in with your questions. We're going to leave a little bit of time at the end, but frankly, we'd much prefer to have it sort of in the flow of things. So don't hesitate to drop those questions in. Um, I'll introduce myself very briefly. My name is Charles Rajo, Charlie. Um, I am in uh, historically, well, actually, I'll give you my fuller background. I am at my core an IT guy. I ran IT operations for about a billion dollar healthcare firm 25 some odd years ago. I thank God I don't have hair because it would all be gray by now, I'm sure. Um, I then ran large scale transformation programs in financial services and healthcare for another decade. About 12 years ago, I ended up writing a book called The Quantum Age of IT, Why Everything You Know About IT Is About to Change. And what I really changed was my career. I started speaking all over the world about the future of IT and what it meant to be a leader in that future. That pivoted to its focus on digital transformation. And then about eight years ago, I put the industry analyst hat on and have been covering the space broadly of enterprise IT and the intersection with digital transformation for throughout that entire time. And it's been a whirlwind. We've seen so much change in that period, um, but I was ready to sort of get off the field, so to speak, or maybe get back onto the field as the case might be. And so in April, I joined Symphony AI and I'm really heading up strategy now. And uh, this is sort of what my job is to try to figure out how all these pieces fit together. And so when we were talking about all of this, I thought it was really important to, you know, we spend a lot of time, we have a co-pilot, as you might imagine, talking about the product. 
but I thought it was going to be very important to talk a little bit, you know, step back a little bit and say, why would we even go down that road? Why should anyone invest in the copilot and, and what do you need to know? And no one is better from our side to help answer those questions than Tim Laws. And uh, I'll let Tim introduce himself and then you'll see why. So, Tim. Next time we do this, Charles, I'm going first because your background is clearly more impressive than, than mine, but well, I'll, I'll jot that down. Um, but thank you. My name is Tim Laws. I'm senior director of our sales team. I've been in the ITSM industry for a little over 15 years now, probably closer to 16 years now. I started my career out as a military contractor, and I got to travel the globe doing installations for our morale, welfare, and recreation sites uh, on our military installations. And when I wasn't doing implementations and trainings, there, I was working the service desk when I was back home. So I did that for about eight years, and then I decided to hop over to the sales side of the house, and I've been in the ITSM sales side of the house since 2016. So worked for a handful of companies, some mayonnaise. We got acquired by SolarWinds, and then about three and a half going on four years ago now, I came over to Symphony AI. So thanks for having me. All right. And what, what Tim sort of didn't talk about there is that he is one of our go-to guys whenever we're interacting with our most important clients. And as I mentioned, we do have a co-pilot product, so he's knee deep into all of this. So, um, and he likewise has heard all these questions. So, you know, we, we <laughs> kind of come at things from different perspectives, but we get these questions a lot. And so we want to dive into it. So again, I'll reiterate, please put your questions in the chat, put your questions in the Q&A as we go. Don't wait, but we're going to dive in. So, Tim, I want to start with this, really the first question, sort of laying the foundation down, right? Mm -hmm. What exactly is a copilot and how is it different from other AI technologies or even other technologies that have sort of predated this? Yeah, I think to start, the difference between a, with a copilot versus kind of a digital agent is the copilot has generative AI technology built around it. If folks kind of knew how the sausage was made with previous chatbots or, or AI, they always had a dedicated input and an output with, with a workflow. So you could only ask it a set of predefined questions. You might have some chit chat capability, but in order for it to fulfill a request or submit an incident or give you a knowledge base article, it had to pick up on predefined phrases or key terms. And then those would be correlated in the back end to a, an outcome. And it was always prescripted. Now what we have is the technology to leverage massive LLMs and natural language processing. And so the co-pilots that we interact with now, they're kind of indistinguishable from a human interaction through chat. Um, and so that's kind of to me where the biggest difference is, is that it understands your input regardless of how you ask it, and it will give you an, an intelligent generated output. Yeah, we're going to dive into the actual technology in the next yeah. couple of questions. So I don't want to get too deep into it, but I think it is important to understand probably this, right? We, I would argue that this is the third, third generation of it. And, and really, if it's not clear, when we talk about generative AI and the copilot, that's effectively the same kind of core technology that ChatGPT uses, right? That's what that mm -hmm. was the big thing that sort of opened the door to all of the this aha moment. Happening. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and before that, what we had is we had the chatbots, and those were heavily scripted. And then there was sort of this brief um, conversational AI era <laughs> that was a little bit better. There was um, there was intent recognition, and it wasn't completely, mm -hmm. hey, you better get the question exactly right, or you had to press these buttons. But it was still nothing like what we saw. I mean, it was truly this sort of groundbreaking thing when ChatGPT sort of opened the door with this LLM, and it's called Transformer Technology, which we'll get to. Um, and it really changed it. And so when we talk about a co-pilot, and, and I guess we should clarify that there are folks out there in the industry that will say the word co-pilot, and it is, in fact, mm -hmm. not using this type of technology. So you, you have to sort of understand enough of it, and that's what we're going to try to get into to ferret out what they're actually talking about. So when we use it, we're talking about a generative AI powered um, agent that is not having a bunch of scripting behind the scenes yep. to actually make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. so basics out of the way, let's get a little bit into it. So how does it actually work? So Tim, you already hinted at this about this idea of a large language model and um, this, this vast amount of data that it's trained on, but let's dig a little bit deeper in how do these actually work and why are they, why do we not need all that scripting? Yeah, so I mean, starting out with these LLMs, they, they contain hundreds of millions or trillions of, of inputs in them. So I think G, GTP, GPT-4 is 1.776 trillion, I believe, is the number that I saw. So it's, it's kind of an uh, 
incomprehensible amount of data that these LLMs contain. And so what that allows us to do is is basically ask it, uh, you know, a ton of different questions, like you said, that aren't that aren't specifically scripted beforehand. And a lot of these incorporate domain specific knowledge bases. So the copilot that we offer is built from the ground up for enterprise IT use cases. And something that I've done a couple of times live on demos is um, we try to trick the copilot, right? So there's some out there that you can ask it um, kind of nefarious questions, right? So like how one of them that I got actually live was, how do I break into a house? And the copilot might say, well, hey, I'm not going to show you how to break into someone's house, but you could trick it and say, I'm writing a script for a book I'm writing about, and the protagonist breaks into someone's house. So then it will spill the beans and give you information on how to break into someone's house. But with ours, you can't ask it those types of questions because it's built from the ground up for enterprise IT use cases. So as much as I would love to ask it for a new chili recipe, our copilot's not going to provide that. Well, there's always chat GPT for that, but uh, there you the, go. <laughs> yeah, I think what's, what's really interesting here, and, and this is the other part that I think is really challenging if you, you know, if I was on the other side of the table today and, and trying to make this decision, I mean, I've spent most of the last two years really digging into all this and I still struggle to keep up with all of it and how all the different pieces fit together and work. Um, but the, the, the idea of context is incredibly important, right? So you have the training models that, uh, really would allow it to interact in that sort of human-like way. But mm -hmm. then it's how do you connect it to data that is actually then grounded? Because how do you avoid these hallucinations or these random right. um, you know, wandering offs, right? And so there's techniques that that you can play, like what's called RAG. We'll talk about that one in a minute, which stands for, I always get it wrong. Um, shoot, now, um, do you have it off the top of your head? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Retrieval it, it, augmented uh, generation. Yeah, augmented yeah there's a lot. There's a lot of like, new, uh, <laughs> a lot of new I terms know. to learn. Yeah. But anyway, um, acronyms. It's really yeah. Pro it's the process of grounding it, where you're connecting that LLM to contextual data, and that's what we have done in our case. So we've done actually two things. We've used that core model. We've then trained a specific model with a specific use case of enterprise IT in mind, and then you can then ground it in your specific enterprise data using RAG, so you start forgetting what the terms mean anymore, um, to yeah. do it. And so you have to really understand all of the sort of underpinnings of how it works. So it's the the LLM is what allows it to have that interaction, and then that, that grounding in the contextual data is what allows it to actually work specifically in the context of your situation. And that's the, that, that's the part where people miss because there's a lot of organizations go, oh yeah, well, we have generative AI. And really all they've done is they've used the OpenAI or the Azure mm -hmm. AI API and they plugged it in. Well, you just have ChatGPT in your environment now and, and you've got to hope that it can actually add value. Um, and so it's really those next two layers where you're training the model specifically on the, the context that you need and then connecting it to knowledgeable authoritative data sources that is critical anything else you want to yeah, add before it, you yeah since you mentioned apis i mean a apis are very important depending on the the objectives of the organization so you know our co-pilot is designed to kind of hook into as much of the tech stack that will be allowed by the organization so that you can support as many use cases as possible so if i'm in if i'm an employee and i'm a new employee and i have to ask about our insurance policy that needs to be able to pull the data potentially from your HRIS system or your documentation repository to get that information too. So having those open API connectors in the background allows the copilot to be more robust and to gather those answers kind of like, I mean, the way that I always describe it is it's it's your best friend within the organization. It's got all the answers for you. It's there 24 seven, 365, either through a portal or Microsoft Teams or Slack or something like that. But if you can expand its reach within the organization, it can gather that information uh, quicker and generate those insights better for the end user. Yeah, I'm going to go to this next question just because we're already sort of talking about it. But you did yeah. bring up something that I realized we sort of glossed over, and that is that a copilot, by definition, is something that sort of sits off to the side, like you said, that assistant, that that person, or that not person, but that computer, that yeah. ad, ad technology is <laughs> always there. It's what it feels like it. I use it every single day. And Soon so enough, like yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, it, it it sits there, and then you're you're able to interact with it to ask the things that you need to ask, and it gives you that insight. And then the other thing that you just pointed to that again we should point out is that at least in when they're done well, like ours, had mm -hmm. ourselves on the back here. Um, it will also allow you to bridge systems, right? Where you can now ask it a question that requires data and context from multiple backend systems, and it can it can assimilate all that and bring it together 
um, synthesize it and give you a response with that context, much like a person who had knowledge in these different mm -hmm. environments would do. So, which leads to this this question, right? And I think we're we're, we're obviously already answering it. Is the technology yeah. behind the copilots mature enough? And I think you know clearly the answer is yes, but with some caveats. So you've already explained some of the why it's it's ready, right? We can ground it with authoritative data sources. We can connect it. But what are some of the caveats that you might put out there? Yeah, I mean, I think it, part of it's going to be the, the the scope of the work there. So um, you know, de defining the use case specifically, I think, is really important. Um, in in an organization so knowing kind of what your objectives are going to be uh the maturity of the vendor as well i mean copilot is kind of a term that's synonymous Every, everyone's using copilot they're kind of slapping it on whatever they need to right now and, and that's actually one of the questions in the chat that we can get to later is copilot everyone's got a copilot now and for some for some reason that's not copy <laughs> copy written um so everyone can kind of use it um but there's there's a ton of companies out there that are using copilots or advertising that they have copilots. So I would definitely say do your due diligence and make sure that their copilot functionality is matching up with what your use cases are and the problems that you're trying to solve. Um, because, you know, with, with these LLMs and, and natural language processing, it may seem on the surface level that you can have a conversation with this copilot and, and get what you're looking for. But unless you kind of do some due diligence or do a proof of concept, that might not always be the case. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that it that that idea of how you ground it and how you leverage it is all important, and which is why you're saying so. Some we'll let's stress this one. Somebody asked the question: Is it the same as the Microsoft Copilot? Yeah. No, we are a partner with Microsoft. We are leveraging the and you can correct me if I'm getting the terminology wrong here, Tim. The Open AI Azure. Um, LLM connection, which is yeah. the, the open open AI's LLM that is hosted on Azure that Microsoft provides. Um, yeah. So it's the, the back end is is very similar to what a Microsoft Copilot does, but this is is proprietary. This is what we built mm -hmm. on top of that platform specifically. And this was another question specifically for service management um, in general, right? So the specifically for really, I would say the enterprise IT use case. So it is that we've tuned the model for enterprise IT use cases with obviously a focus on, on service management, um, in general. Now it is you're into Tim, Tim's point. So we have three versions of this, um, three sort of persona based, uh, versions of it. Microsoft, I think has 137 of them now. So this mm -hmm. is another challenge, right? This is all the tuning and you have to sort of make this a decision on what actually makes sense for you um, in that context. Was there anything yeah, else you wanted to add got, there? We got a couple of questions popping up, but one other thing before we get, dive into the questions is security. Security is incredibly important here as well because you're going to be potentially connecting your infrastructure to a co-pilot and depending on the back end of the co-pilot, for example, ours is single tenant. So ours is a dedicated implementation per customer. So that data stays with that customer. So we're not, commingling that data in the background so you don't have to worry about your proprietary information you know getting in the hands of of potentially through a security breach another uh customer of ours or, or, or competition out there so that's something that's very important well as well um but we've got a question here from robert and daniel so robert wants to know is our co-pilot trained for itsm or service management more generally since we brought up a uh, human resource example. So yeah, ours is ours is designed from the ground up with, we, we're, you know, we're calling it enterprise IT, but IT service management and asset management in mind. But obviously that nowadays goes way beyond just IT use cases. Every end user in an organization is a customer that has a support representative kind of uh, linked to them, whether that's in finance, if I have a payroll issue or human resources, if I have an insurance question or kind of the traditional IT side of the house. Um, but this can go way beyond that too. I mean, we're, we're solving now for security use cases. So we've got some with, with retail customers where if someone goes into a grocery store and tries to run out with a 12 pack of beer, this can process a security form for them and, and generate a police report. So we definitely, it's built for all those kind of standard use cases, but it can also go way beyond that as well. Which leads to one of the other questions that we might yep. as well address while we're on this topic. And that is, is, is our co-pilot able to connect with, um, mm -hmm. with just ITSM systems, but, or also like contact centers and ACD and, and what have you. 
So yeah, the answer is absolutely yes to that. There's there's not really a limit in what we can connect to in the background. So uh, Daniel, good to, good to see you again, buddy. Um, I hung out with Daniel in Milwaukee this past weekend. We got to go to a Brewers game. That was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, it absolutely can. I mean, that's why we offer that that open API in the back end. So that way you can ingest that information. And you know, something that we're going to be working on later is is those um, those inputs. So whether you know, right now it's going to be obviously texting that's coming in, but voice to text, things like that, all that stuff is coming kind of down the pipeline. So I think this can definitely work uh, in, in contact centers for sure. Yeah, and I think it's also important, um, especially if you're in a large enterprise, you there's a good chance you have more than one ITSM system. So yep. this is something that we are certainly doing, and this is part of our ethos, right? At the end of the day, we are focused on on what we call simplicity, transparency, and flexibility, right? We want to make everything that we do simple. And this isn't meant to be a sales pitch, right? But it's important yep. to understand the different contexts because not everyone is going to take this approach. In our case, you can use this copilot because it is this open architecture beneath the covers to connect to other ITSM systems. So mm -hmm. either if you're in the process of a transition or if you are in an environment where you maybe have different business units that are each using different systems and you want to provide a common interface to a customer, right? Something that I've spent a ton of time focused on is the idea of the customer experience and the employee experience as, as drivers yeah. of value. If you wanted to do that, then you can connect it to those systems and it, it can help you sort that out and, and provide that unified interface. Same, just as we were talking about integrating context uh, between like say HR and IT, you can use it, do it, use it for the same purpose when you're bridging against multiple ITSM systems. Um, but 100%. all of this sort of leads to this question that we sort of talked about already, and that is, you know, what are the different types? There's lots of different types, and I think that that's one of the challenges when you're in the market or you're even just starting to think about, you know, is there a place for an enterprise copilot? Um, there are a lot of them, and and mm -hmm. I think um, we obviously have our opinion in how we are approaching it, and as you can probably tell we're we're sort of trying to strike this balance we have these three persona based um co-pilots but we are prejudicing it by focusing on the enterprise it use case and then we are we're really trying to otherwise be as homogenistic as we can but there's other strategies right there are people that are developing mm -hmm. very very narrow co-pilots including microsoft right that's why they have 137 yep. of them some of them are extremely narrow yep. and Specific, there's other players yep. in the market yeah, that have these very narrow ones. And so I think it's important to to understand what it is, what's important to you and how you're looking, what role you're looking this to play. So I'm curious, Tim, you've been you spent a lot of time in the field talking to our clients yep. um, about this. How are you seeing people kind of trying to strike this balance or weigh this out? Yeah, I mean, as you kind of mentioned, there's a there's a co-pilot for what seems like everything now. So you've got uh, the IT support co-pilot that we're kind of talking about now. You've got security co-pilots, operation co-pilots. I mean, Microsoft is pushing their co-pilot on us for productivity, right? So it's kind of everywhere you look, there's now this generative AI co-pilot that can assist you. Um, and and again, I think I think what it starts with is knowing knowing what the customer expectations are. So just kind of listing some of those co-pilots um, co out. I mean, I, you know, we, we cover a lot of those. So we, obviously we have the co-pilot for the end user. We have a co-pilot for the analysts that are within the platform. That co-pilot can generate insights. It can automatically uh, link tickets to the right categories, subcategories, work groups, urgency, impact, things like that as well. But then on the back end, we also have a service automation module. That service automation module has a co-pilot that comes along with it. And you can say, just, just write out what you're trying to do to create the code for that. So you can say, hey, I need a Python script to connect Symphony AI's enterprise IT platform to Workday for employee onboarding or employee offboarding. And that will write the script for you in our uh, service automation module. So, um, you know, ours is more of kind of a, a package cell. You know, you can you can kind of itemize it and break it down if you want to. But I think getting input on what objectives you're trying to solve for will dictate what type of co-pilot you need to implement within your environment. And I think it's also important to really recognize you're not going to end up with one. Even, yep. you know, and, and like I said, we're trying to strike a balance where you, you maybe only have a couple, but even you know, beyond that, you're going to be because there's a whole bunch of folks have, that have co-pilots out there um, and in many cases, very, very specific use cases. So if you mm -hmm. look at the observability space there, you know, there's many of those vendors now that have co-pilots specifically to help with that part of the operation. And and that's not I think it's going to be almost impossible to find a single co-pilot that can cover everything you would need, even from an enterprise IT perspective, let alone the enterprise overall. 
And so I think that is that is critical. Um, you need to have a very clear understanding of what it is you're trying to achieve, who, yeah. who you're trying to deliver it to, and then make sure that the model is tuned to deliver that outcome that you're that you're seeking. Exactly. Speaking yep. of, we, we've been throwing around all these terms. I think it's time we get into a few of these terms. Um, yeah. we've, and I think we've I did define some of them, but I think there's some others that we need to kind of clarify. And if you didn't catch it, Salesforce had Dreamforce last, their, their, their big user conference last week. And of course, Mark Benioff announced it was the end of the co-pilot era, which of course I chuckled at because as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> we barely started the co-pilot era. But as, a, as an example, they are leveraging what they call, well, that's not what they call, but another term called large action models, which um, leads into this whole idea of agentic AI or AI agents. Um, and this is the idea of effectively bridging the gap between an LLM, which is simply giving you information, to an LLM that can actually take action. So that's action. an example of one. You're going to hear a lot about agentic AI and AI agents, and it's something that we are also going down that road. Um, I think we have a little bit, we're taking a fairly cautious attitude, um, and certainly that's that's from feedback we've heard from our customers, that particularly when you're talking about critical IT operations, uh, this autonomous action is something you need to tread lightly with. So so we're taking a cautious approach with that. But I'm curious, uh, Tim, what other, what are some of your favorite bugaboos or favorite terms that uh, often either get missed or misunderstood? There's a lot of new acronyms to learn. So we already touched on LLMs. You just touched on LAMs, but we've got RAG that we touched on before as well. You've got NLP, natural language processing, ML, machine learning, um, APIs, things like that as well. So basically what all this kind of boils down to in the in the background is is so large language models is kind of what is that connected to in the background in the background and you know google has google has their own meta has their own microsoft has open ai obviously so there's a, there's a ton of different flavors that are out there as well um and then you know grounding you talked about as well so linking authoritative sources uh to the copilot um, and then you've got webhooks and API integrations. I mean, I think that's really kind of what makes our co-pilot shine, like I mentioned before, is if we can have connectors to multiple platforms within an organization, we can create that one-stop shop. Um, and that includes, you know, webhooks into the communication platforms as well. So Microsoft Teams, Slack, Google Chat, if I can just pull out my cell phone and ask the co-pilot a question, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to do that to me, that's my shortest route to get the answer, right? Is to pull out my cell phone, wherever I'm at, I could be in the kitchen making a cup of coffee, but I want to report about our service desk or I'm traveling. We were just talking about the event that we're coming up to in, in Orlando in, in November. If I want to know what our travel policy is while I'm burning my toast in the morning, I can do that on my cell phone and get that information there. So there's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, acronyms to learn and a lot of new language. Um, but uh, I don't know, it, it's exciting. Obviously, obviously fun to learn new so, stuff. So can, you, can you ask it how not to burn your toast though? I mean, that would probably be yeah. useful. <laughs> My wife um, certainly so wants I to pick up, <laughs> I, I want to pick up on a couple of these. And actually, I want to really quick, you, you said something. So we're actually talking about this trip that we're going to. And uh, I have to admit, it didn't even occur to me. I was actually just wondering, what is our travel policy? And I thought, yeah. you're right, I need to go use our own. Copilot, and this is this is going to be one of the things that you know we're, we spend a lot of time talking about technology, but the how you get people used to using it and leveraging it mm -hmm. is also a, a really critical part of it. But I want to hit on a couple of key terms here. One is this idea of prompt engineering. We've talked a lot, or if you followed this, it was something that was early, early on. There was talk about there being an entire category of job about prompt engineers. Mm -hmm. I think that's all proving to be fairly false insofar as everyone's going to need to know how to do this. But prompt engineering is just literally how you talk to a a, um, a generative AI chatbot, right? Or how do you interact with a co-pilot? And so I think that's an important thing, but it's also, as far as I'm concerned, I look at it, it's like it's on it's on organizations like ours to simply make the system smarter that you don't really need to be quote unquote engineering a prompt to do it. But that is still a, a sort of a thing now. The other thing I think it's important to understand is that we throw around all these terms like Gen AI and machine learning and deep learning and fail to sort of recognize that they're all very interrelated, that artificial intelligence is this big giant category that the transformer technology, which is what the chat GPT based stuff in all of these cobots are based on, um, is really a function of deep learning, which is a function of machine learning, right? These are all 
related. And so the other thing I think that's really important to recognize that this is one branch, right? And so in addition to the generative AI, there's the predictive AI branch, which is really the element that is looking at the same data and looking for patterns. So it's again, another form of machine learning um, that's looking at the data to, to forecast, to predict events. And so the, the challenge with a large language model or a generative AI approach is that it's simply basing out words. It's literally guessing the next mm -hmm. word in a sequence, right? And so if you ask it to predict something, it's going to do that simply based on what its model has as far as what words often follow one after the other. In a predictive AI model, it's actually using that data to identify historical patterns and use that to predict it. So it's much more reliable and when you merge those two together, suddenly this becomes interesting. So we don't, we, and frankly, I think we do a bad job of explaining this, but one of the things that our copilot does is it's connected back to our predictive AI models to actually give that, that authoritative look that it's not just sort of guessing based on the, the next language. Yep. And so I think it's really important you, you know, to try to get through all this and obviously we can't cover it all now. So highly recommend you sort of spend some time digging into all of these terms and it is overwhelming. It's way too much, but, uh, but there's definitely a lot to it. Yep, for sure. Okay, let's keep going. So now let's get down to sort of more of the business side. Um, how can an organization determine if it's the right time to invest in a co-pilot? So Tim, you've spent a lot of time again with our clients and with people that are potentially examining our product. Mm -hmm. what, what do you see? So it's kind of a loaded question because I think there's a, a lot of ways to answer this. Uh, you know, typically what we start with are what are the pain points? So you know, a, a consumer of this product had some sort of trigger to start their search. Why did they start lo start looking for a co-pilot? And, and that comes from so, some sort of problem that they're trying to solve. So it could be that they get bogged down with a lot of mundane requests. They get a lot of, you know, similar service catalog requests. They get a lot of incidents that are coming in that aren't getting deflected for one reason or another. And it's taking a lot of the the time of the service desk or the fulfiller in those situations. Um, it could be that um, you know they they want to open up the uh, communication methods with the support team. So a lot of folks, you know, email the ticket. We try to push people away from that, but that's still kind of the foundation of communication within an organization. Um, and perhaps maybe they've they've started you know leveraging more teams or microsoft products and so now they want to have the service desk available 24 7 in other areas um so that's kind of you know that that's that's typically where we start kind of evaluating the maturity of the the clients if uh they've had a service portal in the past and they can't get folks to use it then you know we try to challenge them and say well why will a co-pilot make this easier and we obviously bring our proof points to the table to help with that and then also gauging the return on investment too. So I talked about bogging down the service desk. We have a lot of really cool metrics that are we're going to release very soon here um, through a third party vendor that talks about how automating and, and kind of incident deflection and self-fulfillment of service requests can save hundreds of thousands of dollars to the organization. So it's freeing up resources, freeing up their time. And most importantly, you're getting the end user the answer or the fulfillment that they need as fast, not I'm not even gonna say as fast as humanly possible because a human's not even doing it anymore, as fast as automation can allow for. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you can take the human out of the loop if you have a co-pilot that's involved there. So I think that's kind of the that was a loaded answer to a loaded question as well. But there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can determine whether it's the right time to invest in a co-pilot. Honestly, money comes down to most of it. If if they can free up resources and that's gonna be the big ROI, then that kind of determines if they should pursue it or not. Yeah, I mean, so when I look at this, I think I think the ROI is is actually super easy to justify because we've we've been seeking self service and this idea of of um, deflection for a very long time, Years, and yeah. it's and it's easy it's easy to understand why, right? Because our service desk staff is is an expensive resource, and mm -hmm. as our needs grow in the enterprise, you have to add more staff, or you have to find out another way to deal with it, or what most organizations have done, just keep piling more on the service desk, which is a recipe for burnout and and challenges there, right? Mm -hmm. And so. I think the ROI is simple. However, you do have to look at a handful of things, right? You look, I think the organizational culture and the readiness for adoption is critical. And that also yep. involves, I think, your preparedness to, again, sort of change the mindset of how people interact. If you simply throw it out there and go, hey, okay, we have this thing you can use. Well, no one's going to really use it. I mean, I think, you know, people like OpenAI are helping because they're, they're normalizing and, you know, meta, right? They're, they're normalizing the idea of these chatbots, but 
you still have to make the effort to actually drive a cultural shift that this is a new right. way of interacting. Um, and likewise, you, you need to have good data and you need to have good workflows, right? You know, one mm -hmm. thing that we often miss in all the hype around AI is that data and workflows are what underpin the effective use of AI. My, Microsoft is running into this in a lot of cases where, you know, at a product, even at a productivity level, they're trying to leverage co-pilots and under, they find, again, because it's not horribly well grounded necessarily, right? They, that the data is a mess and therefore it's it's not actually providing a lot of value and can actually slow things down. And so having a data state, having um, workflows that are actually um, you know, well established and somewhat mature yeah. can go a long way. Now, by the same token, I you know we talked about it being a bridge. I think it can also, if it's done well or with the right mindset, can actually also help bridge that gap. If you are trying to overcome some of those workflow gaps particularly if you have business units that maybe aren't on the same page or whatever, you can actually use a co-pilot to help with that if you go in with that mindset. So I think there's, it is, um, it's not something, I, I certainly don't think that you should just do it because I think that's that's not going to be a good use. You need to go in with a very de determined uh, mindset about what it is you hope to achieve. Um, but once you get there, I think the ROI is actually, ROI is actually fairly easy to yeah. justify. Yeah, something you touched on too is employee satisfaction. I think that's something that we we hear quite a bit as well as if an employee submits an incident kind of the old fashioned way through email, it might sit for a couple of days with the service desk before they get an answer. And that's just a fact of life because like you said, IT departments are doing more with less right now um, and they got more and more work to, to you know, thrown on them. So the co-pilot can certainly solve that because it is it's available 24 7 365 on any of the communication platforms that you that you want to connect it to so to me that's kind of the biggest thing is is we live in a society now now where people expect things to be done at the drop of a hat um and the co-pilot can certainly assist with that so that'll take down the mean time to resolution you're getting folks answers like i said almost instantaneously within a couple of seconds that could have taken a couple of days before yeah, no, I'm glad you brought it up because it's actually one of the things that I focus on a ton and I meant to say that and I forgot, but I do think that, in fact, I would actually argue. So so this the, the next question is, right, beyond the self-service, how can yep. the pilots transform IT support and operations? That's the first thing I would say. This is not just about deflection. Deflection is mm -hmm. important. It's an important first step and it, it's the easiest way to justify an investment in a co-pilot. But I think that the employee experience, I mean, it, it is you know, I ran IT 25 years ago, and back then, when we had nowhere near the level of complexity that the modern IT organization does, we struggled with, you know, that IT was a department of no, and they, you know, hated yeah. us, and if you get me a right, beer, right, exactly. I'll tell you some of the, the stories about it, right? And it just, <laughs> it, it's, and, and so the, the, it's even harder now. I mean, significantly mm -hmm. harder now, mm -hmm. right? And so when you can deliver an experience where people are delighted, where they go, oh my gosh, that was so amazing. I was able to go and do this and I got this instant response and it took care of my problem. This is where the agentic side starts to come into play. Yeah. Um, it's it's incredibly powerful, but there's other ways even beyond that that I think are important. Um, so what are some of the other things that that you see is that copilots when we start to get that maturity can be transformative? Yeah, I think uh, efficiency in decision making and, and consistency in responses is something that's kind of key as well. I mean, I was certainly guilty of this when I first started my career out on the service desk because I thought I knew the answer to something because I saw it in a previously resolved incident. And guess what? We were both wrong. Uh, and sometimes the, the customer calls you out on that. So, um, you know, allowing the technology to to truly understand what is the right answer um and and making the analyst as efficient as possible so instead of you know writing out a lengthy sop that they need to follow or searching for a document within the knowledge base to link to this this request it can automatically import that stuff for you and just send it out so you're saving a ton of a ton of time there um you know allowing staff to focus on bigger ticket problems is another thing that we hear from our customers quite a bit is that this has allowed them to free up resources because now they have an allotment of hours they didn't have before because the team was bogged down. So when they start to realize that, hey, they're kind of breaking free from these mundane tasks or these things that they give just a tier one support and they just, they live in that all day, the same type of incidents that are coming in, guess what? Now we can do again more with less and we can accomplish more because we have to put less resources into solving these incidents, getting the knowledge base articles to those end users uh, correctly the first time. Um, you know, it, it's not just about deflection, but deflection is a big part of it too. If, if we can track 
that they've used the copilot and an incident was not generated because they received the correct knowledge base article. I mean, that's, that's a win all around for sure. So there's, there's a lot, um, that can kind of go into this, but it, it's definitely beyond kind of the traditional use case of, of just ticket deflection. I agree hundred percent with you, Charlie. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I almost get frustrated with it because that has been the, I mean, even again, predating all this, the conversational AI, that, that was the big mantra. It's all about deflection, deflection, deflection. And I actually say deflection is almost the least important of, I, I look at three big mm -hmm. buckets, right? The employee experience we talked about, right? Just transforming the way they interact and the service we're delivering. Let's also talk about the analyst experience or the IT mm -hmm. operator experience, right? Because how much time do we spend? I mean, you and I have both lived with this. We ended with crappy yep. data in our system because yep. we're putting the burden on them to enter all this stuff. Oh, and by the way, let's make sure we have first call resolution rates up. and Let's make sure we drive through all this stuff. And so we ended up just putting junk stuff in there because we're just trying to get through it. And that's mostly because we're hunt spending all of our time hunting around, looking for solutions. We're exactly. having to type up this at the after action reports or you know the summary of the thing. And AI can help with all that. It can help surface all those issues so you're not having to dig around for it and help you generate the response of what you did so we can create a knowledge article out of it, right? Take away all of that sort of mundacity um, yeah. around it. And so I think that's critical. And then the third thing that I think is that we really can't ignore in any of this is that it also is going to sort of set that stage for changing the way we make decisions or, or maybe the best way of thinking about this is is not missing things, right? One of the, right. and I knew in the demo um, that you often give, and by the way, if you were interested in a demo, please hit us up in the chat or we'll be happy to give you a private demo of all of this, uh, but th that mm -hmm. wasn't the purpose of today's call. But um, when we do give a demo, one of the most important things is like, well, what are the critical incidents that I'm missing, right? What are the things that I need to know that maybe aren't on my radar? And when you can have that assistant, that co-pilot, you can ask those questions and it surfaces that thing, then suddenly you're not dropping the ball on something that you, you just don't need to drop the ball on, right? Because it's helping yep. you identify those gaps. And so when you look at those three things, suddenly it's, it's about so much more than deflection if you, if you approach it right. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, so let's talk brass tacks. We, we, you know, someone has decided they're going down this road. Yes, we're gonna get, go down the co-pilot. We're gonna just wow our, our teams. What does success look like? How how would you measure it? I mean, what's your what's your take? What are you saying? Data, data, data. Um, so again, kind of going back to what were the initial pin points for the prospect to search out a copilot, and then how are we measuring against that? So, employee satisfaction, I think, is always a, is a fantastic one. But then you've got the one, you know, the the metrics that the the service desk leaders are interested in. So, what's our mean time to resolution? Um, things like that. So if that those are going down and then you can correlate to the co-pilot interactions, I think that's obviously going to be a, a great proof point to kind of measure this down. Um, reduction in escalations as well. So um, how long did it take an incident to go to that next level? Maybe it's automatically set to the tier three support and it's getting the attention that it's needed or it's automatically flagged as a major incident. But also, how many are we not kicking up to those guys? Because those are usually big ticket folks, right? They're getting paid the big bucks because they, they they know the most. So how many of those are we solving without escalating is another uh, really good one there. And then um, adoption rate as well. So we mentioned, you know, email to ticket is still kind of tried and true. But if we can reduce the number of those tickets coming in, that means we are leveraging the technology that we have allocated and, and paid for within the organization. And then hopefully those tickets that are coming in through the co-pilot they're getting solved way faster than the ones that are coming in through email. So pushing and like you said, kind of training the the audience to adapt to new technology is another great uh, metric that you can you can look at. Yeah, I think you know clearly are people using it, right? So that's the first yeah. thing that you need to always be looking at. Are people using it? That's the adoption rate. And then the second thing, and this is I think you need to look maybe a little deeper than just raw satisfaction. But specifically, is it helping them? Do they feel it's actually making mm -hmm. their job? easier and we want the answer to be yes if it's if the answer is no and there's some interesting data right now not about us or even about enterprise it co-pilots but um, about generative ai chatbots in general right now that um that that answer is not always yes that in many yep. cases people are reporting that in fact i think the last number was 70 percent of people reporting it's actually making their job harder well that's obviously mm -hmm. not not a success thing right it's not great so we yeah. need to be asking yeah we need to be asking the right questions and looking at it from that right perspective. And then the last thing is what you should ultimately see is the rising tide that floats all boats. And I, mm -hmm. you know, a CIO buddy of mine gave me a, this classic example, nothing to do with co-pilots, but 
and I wouldn't even give the specifics of what it was, but he deployed this technology and he said the key was simultaneously we saw, in this case it was healthcare, patient satisfaction rose, we were delivering better patient outcomes, and our costs were going down. We were driving increased efficiency. And ultimately, it's that's what we should be looking for in yep. a co-pilot, right? That's how you know you're getting this right because people are happier and you're getting that deflection mm -hmm. rate and you're saving money, right? And yep. and so, but but it also means that you need to go into this, and this is why it's really critical that you not just slam it in there or just drop it off to the side and go use it if you want. You have to right. benchmark that data up front so that you can see what those results look like on the back end. Yeah, and I think investing time in spreading spreading the word, spreading the gospel that this technology now exists. So we can certainly help with that during implementation. But you know, whether it's creating interactive videos that you can send out to folks on your service portal. Uh, or your internet, things like that as well, but letting them know this technology now exists and what it's capable of. And so we've helped some customers come up with some specific use cases to send out, say, hey, you guys try this, look how fast this can solve X, Y, Z. Now that we have the copilot, you don't have to wait for us to reply to it. There's no more human in the loop. This is all, you know, figuring it out on the fly within a matter of seconds. Yeah, and I think you have to, uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that there's a lot of bad history with this we've rolled yeah. out really bad chatbots in enterprise c2 over the years yeah yeah and so totally. there's going to be a lot of reticence that we have to acknowledge and address up front and speaking yep. of that you talked about you know preaching the gospel we, we clearly are true believers here we believe in this technology we obviously sell it we think it is it is transformative but that doesn't mean it's perfect right and so mm -hmm. let's talk let's get real about what are the risks and the challenges, right? What are the things that we need to be concerned about, um, not just with our solution, with any solution that you should be looking at, and are there any things we can do to mitigate it? Yeah, I mean, security to me is, is always going to be top of mind with this or any emerging technology that's out there, right? So doing your due diligence on that, asking the right questions of the vendor, how secure is this co-pilot? Where is it getting its data from? Is it sharing its data in the back end? Are we training its model? Things like that as well are all very important questions to ask. Um, and that's really just to protect the, the consumer and their data. Um, so we've taken the approach, like I mentioned before, of having our architecture be a single tenant architecture, which is definitely a benefit in our mind. But there's some vendors that, that are out there that are multi-tenant and you know for a fact that they're commingling the data in the back end. And while it's probably logically separated, there's always a potential risk of that data kind of commingling if something bad were to happen. Um, potential biased or incorrect responses. Um, that's that's something that we need to be cognizant of as well. And that kind of goes along, if everything's working correctly with this, then there might be an over-reliance on AI. And we've taken humans completely out of it. You're trusting it at face value, where it is an amazing technology. It might not always be right. And so we have to use critical thinking. And I think you could make the argument, we have to use more critical thinking outside of this conversation, outside of Copilot, right? This is the... We live in the Instagram generation where folks are just, you know, reading headlines and not actually doing their research. So I think critical thinking really comes into it as well. But I mean, it can be an absolutely wonderful and powerful tool if it's implemented correctly. Yeah, I, I think that the, you know, the biggest risk in all of this is that you go in, I mean, all the way back to where we started, that you go into this without a clear intention, a clear objective of what you hope to achieve and 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 i think that's where you can get yourself into trouble across all of these things you talked yep. about right I, I do think it's really really critical if if i was back in the in the owning it seat and looking at deploying this i'd be really looking at probably three things right one is my data state do i have the right data um because that's going to drive everything that the the that the the, the, the copilot is going to be pulling from Secondly, am I, how do I keep a human in the loop, particularly during the initial stages? How do I ensure mm -hmm. that I'm watching these? I, I don't want to throw this out there and just replicate bad experiences of the past. I just assume so I it's going to work. Sure. Yeah, Exactly. Right. So keeping that, you know, taking, so I think there's an extremely active role, particularly for the service desk in these initial stages to sort of mm -hmm. keep your hands on it. And then, and then the third thing is I'm really focusing on that cultural adoption piece of it, encouraging people to use it with the belief that it actually is delivering a better experience on both sides, right? This is, so, I, and I think we've alluded to this, but there's the co-pilot, and I think we mostly tend to think about this in terms of the customer facing, but the analyst co-pilot is just as important and probably harder yeah. from a cultural adoption standpoint, getting your IT team, and it's not, we say analysts, it's not just service desk, it's across the IT operational landscape, mm -hmm. getting them used to that I've got this resource that I can constantly turn to and not falling up on going through the normal, digging through the folders on SharePoint sure. or whatever to try to find the info, right. information to go here first. That's a major cultural shift. 
And I think if you don't address that, it's going to fall apart every single time, technology aside. And so I think that's that's a, a really significant concern. Yep. We've and then our two new question. Okay, Sorry. Shoot. we've got yeah, two yeah. new questions in the chat I was going to address. So one of them you just kind of touched on, actually. So how does the co-pilot help service desk agents in Symphony? And it's not just within our product, Apex. It's within any ITSM uh, product out there. But it can generate insights instantaneously so we can read the incidents or the subject and description and then generate those insights for the analysts. It can automatically assign the incident to the right work group, the next available analyst, uh, categorize it, subcategorize it. Uh, dictate the impact, the urgency. It also can dictate the chances of this type of incident being escalated based on multiple factors there as well. So the goal for the analyst side is to help make them as efficient as possible. So if it didn't come in through the co-pilot, uh, whether it's on Teams or through a portal, once that incident is ingested into the system, the co-pilot is analyzing all that information. So giving them the right knowledge base article, giving them the right solution, things like that as well, so that they can be as efficient as possible and kind of what, what we talked about, Charles, you know, data integrity and making sure that the answers that are being sent out of the service desk are the most accurate as possible. And we have another question. Uh, so data is key to measuring success. How is this facilitated with your co-pilot that will need to integrate with source systems or in our case, our legacy ITSM? service now so um we we have all the metrics in the background um that we can gather right now it's not in a graphical setup that's something that we're going to be releasing very soon so there'll be kind of like a co-pilot workbench you can call it its own kind of module where you can have all these metrics in a dashboard um but right now we have it all as raw data that can be exported um, but like i said we're going to have a graphical interface very soon I'm glad you could answer that one because I did not know the answer to that question. Almost, you got, you got a half, whoever did that one, you got a half stump point, half stump point. There you That's go. <laughs> yep. All right. All right. Our last question, we're almost out of time. Um, and this was just kind of navel gazing a little bit into the future, but I think it's important as yeah. we as we try to envision where this goes because this technology is changing so quickly, right? How, what is the evolution? How how should organizations prepare for what is coming next? I know I have my opinions, but but what do you think, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm super excited about the predictive side of things. I mean, I, I can you can go down a rabbit hole and this can be like Skynet or uh, I forget the Tom Cruise movie where they know you're going to commit a crime before you commit it. Um, but uh, it's I, I'm super excited about that. I mean, this is this is in its infancy, you know, and uh, it's it's already really powerful today. Um, so for the future, I mean, you know, our co-pilot right now is all uh, text entry. Um, but that being said, I can imagine this being, you know, like Siri and the Google assistants are only getting smarter. So that's going to have copilot built into it, I'm assuming. So it's 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 going to be like it's going to be with you all the time is what I'm imagining. Flash forward five years, you know, you've got AirPods on. It's going to be in your AirPod. It's going to you're going to be able to ask it any darn question you want to. It's going to be in your glasses soon or your contact lenses, things like that. I mean. Um, speaking of rabbit holes, I'll try to dig myself out of this one, but it, it the co-pilot's going to be everywhere. You're going to be asking it any and every question about life, work, whatever, um, through multiple communication methods. So I guess I guess we should qualify here that Tim is not giving us a product roadmap here just so we're all clear. No, yes, safe harbor, <laughs> safety harbor. That's order. not on our roadmap. <laughs> uh, someone was kind enough to say that the movie was called Minority Report. I love that Minority movie. Report. Um, I was going to say Vanilla Sky. That was the other one. Yeah, Minority okay. Report. That's a good movie. You know, <laughs> I think I look at it and there's two big things and, and what you just alluded to, I call ambient technology, that it is going to be omnipresent sort of everywhere and you won't have to think that hard. And and we're already doing some of that in our current roadmap where we're injecting some of this proactive and predictive elements directly into the workflow um, where it just sort of happens, right? That proactive mm -hmm. side. And then the other thing all, you also just alluded to, I think is, is really critical is this idea of personalization or contextual awareness. So right now we have three personas and that's how we've tuned the model. I, I do think, again, not roadmapped right now, but I think where this technology overall evolves to is that we end up with everyone effectively gets their own personal co-pilot that knows exactly right. what their job is, all the context that they need to know to do it, and and now suddenly becomes super super powerful because you know even on a service desk I have people that specialize in one area even if they're ostensibly right. doing the same sort of job um, or if you have them you know grouped in different areas right so it's just this idea that this is what I work on or maybe even this is where I need help with and and I'm already seeing that like I um, I'm trying to learn Spanish and one of the things I do is I have a like a formal learning program but I actually trained 
ChatGPT to actually become a Spanish tutor where I can converse. And I gave it special special instructions. And, you know, I think that the early, early stages of that sort of, of personalization. And the last one we talked about, it, the evolution of agents. Don't believe all the hype right now. I, I'm a fan of Salesforce and what they do in general. But this idea that we're just going to unleash thousands of agents all over the enterprise just doesn't really make a lot of sense right now. But I do believe we are going to be moving to this greater level of autonomy where we're going to have much more complex decision making, much more complex problem solving that can happen more autonomously. And I think one of the challenges for everyone here and every IT leader is going to be where is that water's edge? How much autonomy do we want them to act with? Where do we feel comfortable with that? And as the technology gets there, and I think this is this is we're talking months here, like in the next couple of years. Um, that will be facing these decisions, you need to be prepared to really ferret that out, which goes all the way back to why data and workflows are so absolutely critical. Yeah. Because yep. in order to trust something to act autonomously, you have to have a workflow well defined and you need to have data you can trust. And so yep. they all, which is why, you know, why we're so focused on all of this, that it all comes mm -hmm. together. We don't believe you can have just kind of one piece of the puzzle. Uh, anything you want to add before you wrap this up? No, we promised we'd give 10 minutes for Q&A, and turns out we lied, Charlie. We were having too good of a I discussion, know. so we've got, we're, we're, we've got well, four minutes left. Of, yeah, we had lots of questions in there, so it's like I feel yeah, like we no, did pretty good. good with that. Fantastic, yep. So yep, um, any other questions, this is your chance. Uh, before we wrap this up, we'll, we'll give you a pause. Tim and I will banter for 30 seconds if you have any other questions that you'd like to throw out there. Um, but I think overall, Tim, this has been important. I mean, I, to me, the, yeah. the judge of a good event is I learned something and I definitely have learned something from you in this process. So um, what what is your takeaway? What is the, uh, if if you were to, if someone is tuning in here, they showed up, they got their time wrong, they showed up for the last 60 seconds. How can you mm. summarize everything we talked about, the big takeaway for for them? Yeah, I mean, I guess big takeaway. I I think copilots are. It, it's definitely the future that we're we're going to. You know, good, bad, or ugly. I think they're, they're we're surrounded by them right now. It's it's just in its infancy. It's going to be in every product and everything that we consume very soon if it's not already there. So um, just kind of understanding where the technology is going and then adapting your organization to to meet that. Um, and you know, the the benefits to me right now are they're quite amazing when it comes to copilot and the flexibility that it has and you know something that's that's fun fun and a little nerve-wracking when we're doing these demos since it is like talking to a human uh like we were talking about before charlie someone could ask us what's the weather today and we could be it literally in the exact same location and we would both give the correct answer just in a slightly different way and that's that's what it's like talking to a, a copilot right now is it really is like talking to another person so um you know it's it's something that i think folks need to take advantage of uh, recognize why the organization wants to move in that direction and what what issues can they solve for and then I think you'll see the benefits very soon yeah and my, my last takeaway is really just to extend that actually is not something that we even said but I think is important to say and that is that we're in this interesting brief window of time where right now this is still sort of experimental people are still yep. curious about it and I think within the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to cross that chasm and it will be an expectation that our mm -hmm. employees within the organization, our customers are going to have so much exposure to this technology that they're going to expect it. And, and it's going to be you know, very similar to when I wrote my first book. It was really about the dawn of the Facebooks and the Apple iPhone, where suddenly we had this highly consumerized technology that worked. It was intuitive. And people came into the office with a bunch of green screens and said, why do I have this horrible technology that I'm, I'm trying to do this job? And I think with something like a copilot, it's going to be very similar that that right now it's OK if you don't have something, if you're not going down that AI road. But within the next couple of years, it's going to flip and it's going to yep. be a detriment to you if you don't have an answer and you're not going down that road. So that would be my big takeaway. Well, with that, I think we are going to wrap this up. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I hope you found some value of it. If you can, if you have any other questions, please send us an email, reach out to me or Tim. If you'd like a demo, mm -hmm. we'd of course would love to show that to you. Um, but otherwise, thanks for coming and we will see you at the next event. Bye. Thanks everybody.